Chapter 30, The Longest Day. It's June in San Diego. It's the time of year we call June gloom. Here's a photo of the vineyard in the morning. Look at it. It's just wet out there. Uh, it's damp. It's dark. And imagine now spraying a vineyard in those conditions. Uh, it's a lot of work. Today is also June 6th. Um, so we remember all those who sacrificed themselves on D-Day. So let's go into the story and honor those who we remember. Chapter 30, The Longest Day. On June 6th, as, as Paul reenacted the invasion of Normandy, the vineyardisto washed dishes, then the clothes, as they spun around the machine, she spun around the house, dusting furniture, vacuuming every square inch and the corners twice, then swept the back patio and the French terrace, whose liberation was secured through the valor of her husband. She hung freshly washed garments, sheets, towels, and blankets on the terrace rails to dry and raise a purifying sun, taking delight in the damp odor of chlorine. So what if bleach leaves tie-dye patterns on his pants? At least they're clean. Every move observed by a pair of squirrels who occupied the mama and baby whale boulders adjacent to the house still occupied. Although Paul had issued a fatwa against the squirrelists, Sheila gave them macadamia nuts her husband picked from their trees. He was proud of their nuts, harvesting them before the squirrels. She stored them in the sink of an unused wet bar overflowing with nuts and corks from the bottle they opened every day. We never eat them, she thought. They're too good to waste. I might as well feed the squirrels. She vacuumed Bluey. She vacuumed Bluey, banished from the battlefield because biological and chemical warfare isn't suited for a dog. He was delighted to spend time with his mistress, especially when she pressed the vacuum's nozzle against his fur, as much as Jenny Lee purred when Carrie Ann braided her hair in college. The dog enjoyed the vacuum suction on his mane. The moment Sheila flipped the vacuum switch and it wailed with high pitch intensity, his barks weren't commanding the machine to shut up, but for his mistress to vacuum him. She did, changed his water, and headed outside to spend the rest of the day raking the vineyard floor. Mist. Mists of cool vapor from the ocean crept up the valley followed by fog that swallowed the mountain in June gloom, and she cleaned in a cloud. Humidity and microscopic water droplets dampened her sombrero, penetrated her clothes, filled her lungs, and chilled her bones. Late in the afternoon, Bluey trotted to Paul, barking. Are you hungry? Bark, bark. What do you want? Bark, 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 running around in circles. You didn't eat yet. All right, let's go home. They walked down the mountain to the house. Darling, is that you? Sheila called softly from her room. It's me. Are you taking a nap? Since it was late, since it was late to be napping, Paul checked on her and found her in bed with her eyes closed. I'm so tired, she said. You're always tired. My body aches all over. That was a concern because she rarely complained about pain. I'll get you an aspirin. He went to the kitchen to look for an aspirin while she dragged herself out of bed to the toilet, where only a little trickled out. Please feed Bluey. I couldn't feed him, she whispered. Come, boy. And the dog devoured three cups of food within seconds of hitting his tin bowl. Paul returned to the cupboard, found a bottle of acetaminophen, and brought two capsules with a cup of water to Sheila in bed. Please change Bluey's water, she said, then moaned. It hurts. What hurts? Everywhere, all over, my whole body. Take this. He put his left hand under her neck to support her head so she could swallow the pill. What is it? Tylenol. Are you trying to poison me? No, this will ease the pain. You should drink some water. You may be de dehydrated from working outside. He put the pill into her mouth and she swallowed it with, with water from the cup he held to her lips. His phone rang, a customer from work. He answered the call and went into another room to let Sheila rest. After a while, Bluey entered the room whining. 
and Paul wrapped up the call and returned to Sheila's room to find her eyes closed and bubbles at the corners of her mouth. Are you all right? Foam oozed. Sheila, Sheila, he called, patting her on the legs, arms, and cheeks without response. He lifted her eyelids and saw only white. Her eyes rolled back in their sockets. He called 911. The operator asked, is she breathing? Yes. That's good. Can you cover her body with a blanket to keep her warm? She may be in shock. Yes, she's covered. Do you have a dog in the house? Yes. Can you lock him in a room or put him out back so it doesn't interfere when the paramedics arrive? Yes. Bluey, come here. And, and he led him outside to the terrace. For a home located in the outback, paramedics, paramedics arrived quickly. The firehouse, less than three miles away, built the year before. Paul always said it's good having a fire station close by, thinking one day he might need it when having a heart attack. He never imagined it would be Sheila. Paul met the captain at the bottom of the driveway to escort the rescue team to Sheila. There was no use asking them to remove their shoes. Sheila would forgive this transgression. What's the situation? My wife's unconscious in bed foaming at the mouth. She's unresponsive. I don't know what it is. I've never seen her like this before. She was fine in the morning and worked outside all day. When I came inside, she was in bed, complaining about pain all over her body. I gave her a Tylenol and shortly after that she passed out. Is there a dog in the house? I put him outside, said Paul, pointing to the good shepherd on the terrace, who watched tentatively. Take us to her. And Paul led the way. The captain took her blood pressure, while Joe the paramedic prepared an IV, and a third responder pricked her finger for a blood test. Blood sugar is 310. Roger that, said the captain. Pulse, 28 beats per minute. Blood pressure, 50 over 30. Start an EKG, said the captain. They inserted the IV into her arm to get fluids inside her. When is the last time she ate? I I'm not sure. We had breakfast together, but I was outside all day. Why? Her blood sugar is really high. Her p pulse and blood pressure are really low. We're taking her to the hospital. They strapped her to a gurney and carried her out the house, deftly maneuvering her over the wrought iron fence at the entrance and down the steep driveway into the ambulance. Meet us at the hospital. I'll gather her things and see you there. Paul packed a small bag with clean underwear, sweatpants, a thin wool sweater, t-shirts, and a bra. She would want clean underwear and clothes when she woke in the hospital. He was beginning to wonder if she would wake up. But what's wrong with her? Is this the big one? Is life like that? Here one moment and gone the next? He looked at her room and saw the spent cartridges from the IV needle, torn packets of alcohol wipes, and bloodstained gals, her tidy room, trampled by the boots of four fire, firefighters, littered with debris, blankets on the floor, resembling a row of ravished vines after the harvest. He brought Bluey inside. Mama's sick. I'm going to the hospital to be with her. You stay here and watch the house, and I'll come back later tonight. He gave Bluey a big hug, locked the front door, and drove to Polymer Hospital. As the ambulance sped down to 15, Joe the paramedic, by Sheila's side monitoring her vitals, informed his supervisor. Hey, Captain, we have a problem. What is it? Her heart stopped. 